Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and I love living in the 21st century because you can get a fully functional computer for 35 bucks and uh, this kind of started with the original Raspberry Pi a few years ago and this is now the latest iteration called the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus and it is an incremental upgrade over last year's Raspberry Pi 3 which was a pretty big upgrade but there are a couple of things on here that are worth talking about from a performance standpoint that we'll be exploring a little later in this review. And I'll also talk about some of the things you can do uh, with a $35 computer because these things are just a lot of fun uh, just to play around with because you get yourself a pretty functional little Linux computer that uh, is almost bulletproof in the sense that if you screw something up, you can always just rewrite its SD card and start over again. A really good way to learn basic computing and programming and a whole bunch of other stuff given how flexible these things are. And what's really cool is it kind of takes me back to when I was a kid, when every computer you had, you just plugged into a television. Uh, this works the same way, of course, through its HDMI connector. Now, before we get into the regular review here, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds, a whopping $35. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, and no brand or anyone else has reviewed this content before I uploaded it. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Uh, these Raspberry Pis are uh, single board computers and most of the guts of the computer are located inside its central processor. Uh, this one, just like the prior edition, has a Broadcom BCM2837, but this one runs a little faster than last year's model did. So they added a heat spreader to this to uh, better deal with the thermals on it. And as a result, they're clocking the processor a little higher than they were in the prior edition. So this one runs at 1.4 gigahertz as a default speed. Uh, some folks have been able to clock them even higher than that with an added heatsink on there. Uh, that's versus 1.2 gigahertz on the prior version. Uh, like the prior version, it only has a gigabyte of RAM. So maybe when the Raspberry Pi 4 comes out, we'll get a little more RAM on these things. But uh, they are very efficient, so you should have enough to do some of your projects that you'd like to do on there. Uh, this metal thing here is another new feature. They've added dual band wireless to this model. Uh, so it now supports wireless AC at five gigahertz and you'll have a better Wi-Fi experience out of this thing as a result. I'll do some testing in a few minutes so you can see some of the differences in performance between this one uh, and the prior edition. So if you have been experiencing Wi-Fi issues, uh, this one might do better for you, especially maybe in a home theater or cord cutting environment. We've done a lot on this one uh, related to cord cutting and this one's going to do a little bit better. They also sped up the ethernet on here because you can also choose to plug in a wired network to this if you want. Now on the old ver version, you had uh, 100 megabit ethernet here on the ethernet jack. Uh, they have upped it to gigabit, but there is a little bit of a caveat there in that uh, the ethernet is running over a USB 2.0 bus, which means you're not going to get true gigabit speeds, but you will get speeds faster than the prior edition ethernet. So again, if your project needs more uh, speed on its ethernet, you'll have it now. And again, we'll do some benchmarks of this in a few minutes so you can see the speed differences between the two. And they've also cleaned up and changed some things on its power management. So you can see uh, this new power management system down here in the lower left-hand corner. You can see what it looked like before. Uh, so it looks like they've done some work on that. They said the power will be more stable on this new version. They also added the ability through these four pins here uh, to power the entire computer with the data cable that you plug into its ethernet jack here, which is cool. Uh, that's called power over ethernet. Uh, my wireless access points in the house here use that and they're going to be releasing a, what they call a hat that will go on top of the board here. It'll connect up with those four pins and then uh, you just plug in your data cable and if you have a uh, power over ethernet injector or a special power over ethernet switch, uh, that will allow you to bring power and data uh, to the device so you don't have to plug it into a wall anywhere. That could add a lot of flexibility for uh, different projects that you might be doing with your Raspberry Pi. And these things are really designed for projects. You can, of course, just run software on them like a lot of people, myself included, do. But uh, all of these pins up here are addressable so you can uh, make electronics that you connect up to this and have this kind of be the logic center for your 
uh, projects, whether they be robotics or sensors or that kind of thing. Uh, they have some other things that you can add onto these boards as well. And I'm going to point you at the uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation's website. They're actually a nonprofit that makes these uh, to give you some ideas about the kinds of projects you can do with a Raspberry Pi. It's got such a tremendous community around it now that uh, if you've got a kid looking to learn more about electronics, or maybe you want to, uh, you can really get the full picture of being able to uh, code and then build stuff and have those two components, the Raspberry Pi and your electronics creations, work together. Now on the bottom here is a micro SD card slot, and this is how you boot it up. This is essentially its hard drive, so you uh, burn images to these little cards and pop them in here and boot up the Raspberry Pi to get going. Uh, Raspberry Pi's uh, foundation has a, a distribution called Raspbian that is kind of a basic operating system that we're going to start with here in a second. Uh, there's also other things out there like media players. We've covered uh, Libre Elec in the past here, which I use as a little cable box with my Raspberry Pi. There's retro game emulators. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can get uh, to boot up with your Raspberry Pi. And anytime you want to boot up something differently, you just take out a different card and pop it in and you're good to go. That's really uh, very flexible there. It connects up to your television with HDMI, of course, and uh, you power it with a micro USB connector. I do recommend using a, a power adapter that can deliver two and a half amps of power. That, they tend to like that amount. Uh, it's not going to work as well if you just plug it into a phone charger, for example. Uh, the Raspberry Pi will give you an indicator if it's starting to run low on available power. You'll see a little uh, lightning bolt in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, but definitely use a higher-powered USB power supply with this. Uh, there are some kits that you can get that have the right power supply in the box, so I may, uh, I'll point you at one of those in the uh, affiliate link down below so you can find that. Over here is where you can plug in uh, audio but also video, so you can actually run this out to an old composite television, an old CRT TV if you want to do that, so you have that option available to you. Over here, you've got your Ethernet port that I mentioned. Then you have four uh, USB 2.0 ports for keyboards and mice and other devices. Again, just remember, you're not putting a lot of power into this device. So if you've got something like an external hard drive or something that requires a little more power, it may work. But if you have too many things plugged into this thing, it might uh, not work. So my advice would be that if you do want to add USB devices that go beyond the standard keyboard or mouse, uh, get a powered USB hub and then have that hub provide the power for the device so that uh, you're not drawing too much uh, out of the Pi itself. It'd be great to see maybe some uh, higher voltage Raspberry Pis or higher wattage uh, Raspberry Pis come out in the future that might give you that flexibility. So that's the basic hardware tour here. Uh, so let's boot this thing up and see what we can do with a $35 PC. We're going to start off with Raspbian. I'll show you some things there. We'll look at some retro game emulation and then we'll go on to some benchmarks. Okay, so I've got our Raspberry Pi booted up to the Raspbian operating system. And what's nice about this is that once you get that card written and they've got some very uh, helpful instructions on their website, uh, you get a lot of stuff in here right off the bat. Let's take a look at some of the things you'll see here. So a bunch of programming stuff, including Scratch, which is great for uh, kids to learn the basics of computer programming. But you also get things like an Office suite here. This is LibreOffice, which includes a uh, spreadsheet that you'll see popping up here. And it actually loads up pretty quickly. It feels pretty snappy for the most part. Again, we're on a $35 computer. This is not going to uh, rival something you'll pay more for. But uh, you do have a fully functional spreadsheet here. I could put in a bunch of numbers and uh, do all of my spreadsheet stuff here like you might do on Excel or something. And that works really nicely. Uh, there's also a uh, word processor that's similar to Microsoft Word that you can use called Writer. And again, all this stuff is built in. They've got a whole big repository with more things that you can download for it and uh, all in just a very useful little computer here that's gotten a lot better uh, over time since I started playing with this. And it actually does pretty nicely browsing the web. I've got uh, the Chromium browser here running. This is built into that Raspbian distribution. I think there are other browsers available for it also. Uh, Chromium is the open source version of Google Chrome, so it has the same interface. You can put your Google account in there and everything. Uh, they also installed uBlock Origin by default, which does uh, help speed it up on this lower end hardware. Uh, here I am playing a 1080p video from my YouTube channel at 30 frames per second, and it's able to keep up just fine with it. In fact, these uh, Raspberry Pis do very well as media playback devices too, and I've covered a lot of that here on the channel in the past, so I'll put a link to some of those videos 
uh, down below in the video description. But overall, it's just a really good experience for 35 bucks. You got all those great uh, office applications built right in, a whole bunch of other software you can install on it as well. And uh, like I said, it's just really starting to feel like a real computer these days. Uh, this one is uh, not all that much faster than last year's, but it is a little bit quicker. It feels just a little snappier as I'm uh, running around to different menus or uh, visiting different websites. And uh, overall, again, it's been just a very good experience. But let's take a look now and see what the numbers look like on this one. We're going to start with some web benchmarks, and then we'll look at how well this new networking uh, infrastructure is working inside of the new Raspberry Pi. So we're going to begin with the browserbench.org speedometer test. And this is a benchmark that runs inside of, in this case, the Chromium browser. We often run this on Google Chrome on the other computers I test here on the channel. And I like to run this benchmark because this is a very practical benchmark. It tries to replicate uh, the kinds of things that a user might encounter browsing the web. Uh, in this case, a lot of JavaScript with a uh, form that gets filled out and uh, adjusted over the course of many of these repetitions that this test runs through. And there we got a score of 15, uh, which is 16% faster than uh, the 12.9 we got on the Raspberry Pi 3 from about a year ago. Uh, incidentally, the uh, change in clock speed on the new one is about 16% also. So we're seeing that play out here uh, with this very practical test. And I like to run this one because, again, I think this really aligns with uh, what a user experience might be when they're uh, browsing around. Now, of course, we can compare that to some of the PCs we've looked at recently, and it's no contest. But again, we're talking about a $35 piece of hardware here versus something that costs several hundred dollars. So uh, I think we're doing OK here uh, with this particular hardware. Let's take a look now at its networking performance. We're going to test the Wi-Fi and compare it to last year's and also test the Ethernet. Now, before I started recording, I ran some iPerf benchmarks on my original Raspberry Pi 3. And what an iPerf test is, is a means of seeing how much data you can transmit between two different devices on your network. So I had plugged that uh, Raspberry Pi 3 into my Ethernet network. Uh, its maximum supported speed on that network is 100 megabits per second. And you can see here we were getting about 94 megabits per second in measured speed uh, over the course of this iPerf test. Now what I'm going to do is just run out over to that test and we're going to run it against this particular device. So what I'm going to do here on the Mac uh, is go ahead and click Run Test. And what this is going to do uh, is transmit data over my Ethernet network from this Mac over to the Raspberry Pi and measure how fast it can do that. Uh, so we'll kick off the test here. And you can see that the uh, Raspberry Pi here is receiving data. And if we go back to the Mac screen, uh, we can see we're uh, transmitting right now at about 230 megabits per second or so, give or take. But we are definitely uh, more than double here what we were getting on the old version of the device. Because again, uh, this one sort of supports gigabit Ethernet, uh, but it's doing it over a USB 2 bus. But that is still faster than having 100 megabit Ethernet as your starting point here. So I'm seeing about double the speed here, at least on Ethernet. And that includes tests going from the Mac to the Raspberry Pi, as well as the Pi going back to the Mac. Uh, so we're definitely seeing better Ethernet performance here as they promised. So that is a good thing. And if you're curious what app I am using to run these tests, uh, this is called Wi-Fi Perf, which is a free app from the Mac App Store. And this runs iPerf as its testing back end, but this is a nice front end that they put on it. And if you look on the Raspberry Pi, I am running the command line version of iPerf there. And this is something that's available uh, in their package repositories. It was very easy to get this test installed if you want to try to do it yourself. So let's take the same test now and run it over the new Wi-Fi system on the Raspberry Pi on my AC network. Let's take a look. So on the original Raspberry Pi with its 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio, we were getting speeds at about 45 to 50 megabits per second. Uh, the average here on this test looked like about 47. Uh, so let's go over to our test now and see how it does uh, over the AC network. And again, we'll push this uh, client to server here from the Mac to the Raspberry Pi. And things are starting to transmit now. And uh, there you go. You can see what's coming in. So uh, we're doing much better here also. Almost uh, actually 100 megabits per second on that run there. Uh, just over Wi-Fi, my AC wireless radio 
uh, over to the Raspberry Pi. So again, a dramatic speed improvement for uh, wireless on here, which might make a difference for media streaming and other things. Now, uh, Wi-Fi is always a tough thing to test because it depends on uh, where your access points are located and how much traffic you have going over those access points. I've got one here in my ceiling that isn't too far away from the Raspberry Pi, so this is kind of an ideal condition, but I think this also gives us a very good idea as to uh, what kind of speeds we can expect. And also, like before, I ran some tests earlier in the opposite direction, and everything seemed to work at the same speed there, so they were consistent. I also ran some tests on the 2.4 gigahertz radio on here, and that one performed about the same as the old one did. So I think the real performance gains here are going to be using its 5 gigahertz radio along with that uh, improved Ethernet performance. So all good on that front. That's probably its biggest uh, jump in performance is its networking. But what I'm going to do now is just shut this thing down. We're going to switch over to uh, RetroPie and check out the Nintendo 64 emulator to see if this new version can play the Nintendo 64 any better than the old one. Let's have a look. All right, so I've got RetroPie installed on the device here running the N64 emulation, and it's not terribly quick yet. It's still running a bit uh, laggy here as it does on some of the other versions. There are some ways to tweak this and overclock and try to get it to a better place, but I don't think there is a huge performance difference on uh, this new device versus the old one, except maybe being able to clock it a little higher. I know there's some folks out there who are some experts in this that might uh, sound off with some different perspectives on this, but I really wanted to see if this one was any quicker than the old one insofar as some of this higher end emulation is concerned. And uh, I don't think that's the case in this instance. It really isn't giving me enough performance here to say that this one is uh, light years better than the old one. But uh, it is good, though, still, for uh, running some other retro stuff, namely some arcade games here. So I've got one of my favorite games from the 80s loaded up right now. This is the arcade version of Afterburner, and it's running uh, quite nicely on the hardware here. And I think 8 and 16-bit emulation is probably the sweet spot for a Raspberry Pi emulation station at this point. You can also get some pretty decent performance out of PlayStation 1 games on it. And again, you've got a slight CPU bump here, so that might make a difference to some degree, but I don't think it's enough to really uh, make this a must-have upgrade over the old one, at least for retro gaming fans. But the big change, I think, comes in uh, the networking performance that we saw earlier. So Ethernet is uh, double the original speed, and we're seeing a significant bump thanks to uh, the AC wireless support that's now on this device. And I think those changes are probably the most significant ones for people who are buying these things to use them as media centers or uh, general computing devices. I think the CPU bump here is also going to be useful for people that are using uh, the desktop computing features of this, the web browser, the word processor, the spreadsheet, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I did feel a little bit of a bump in snappiness, if you will, and we saw on that benchmark also that the new one is doing a little better there too. So a nice incremental upgrade for some. Uh, if you are really looking for better networking performance, this is a significant upgrade, and uh, I continue to just love these little devices for their versatility and all the cool things you can do with them, and I just wish I had more time to do more projects with it, but hopefully I'll get my daughters into this soon and we'll be able to uh, play around with this, and I'll talk about some other uses for the Raspberry Pi. Let me know what you're doing with your Raspberry Pi down in the comments below, and until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.